savings begin fundamentally with measurement. I remember, oh, let's see, 96, that would be 12 years ago, visiting a couple of hard drive plants. One of them used 54 times more energy per drive than the other one. Guess which one went out of business that year? There was a chip maker with a rated chilled water plant COP in the worst plant, 42% below the best one. It was in a, actually a less difficult climate than Singapore. But only one of them was measuring, uh, was, was actually measuring the COP. The, the rest we just took their word for it. And when they measured it, it was 21% worse than the rated COP. You know, uh, guesses only count in <laughs> horseshoes. Or, uh, you, you really need to measure. And actually, the best COP that they had was 20, over 20% worse than the Singapore state of the art. The owner was losing over a million US dollars a year just by not adopting its own best practices in chiller plant. And information is cheap and powerful, but it's really viscous. It sticks to the people who've got it. I remember the factory where we saved 30,000 US dollars the first year by labeling the light switches. People didn't want to turn stuff off because they were afraid it the unlabeled switch might control something important or they might inconvenience someone. Labels are cheap. <clears throat> there was a certain hard drive factory not far from here that saved a large amount of money <clears throat> by properly labeling the idiot gauge where if the needle went from the red zone or from the green zone to the red zone showing pressure drop across the main filter bank, it was time to change the filters. So we had them label to paste up two little handwritten labels, one called cents per drive, the other called million dollars profit per year, which was a nonlinear function of cents per drive <clears throat> because uh, if you got to certain price points, you jump market share. Very, very lucrative to put the, that information in front of the operator. And it's just amazing how much energy waste you find by measuring goes in as and goes out as an understanding how your plant is really working. But too often we use poor sensors or uncalibrated sensors. The results are utterly worthless. We don't know whether they're the right number or not. There's too much drift, too much inaccuracy. We ought to figure out how much accuracy is worth and then make sure we get it. And few plants are designed to measure what's needed or to present it to the operator real time in effective graphics. I would urge you to look at Mr. Lee's practice in this regard. Uh, the, the mind has hundreds or thousands of times more bandwidth for a color picture, a, a graphical display, than for tables of numbers, which is what too often the operator has on the screen. Graphics are incredibly effective in understanding how a complex system is behaving. And, you know, it's just simple stuff like this. <clears throat> Notice that when you look at how the chillers work in a certain plant over many hours, you find they're always worse except maybe down here, than the manufacturer's specification. The second and third chillers are cutting in too early because of a control problem. Oh, and by the way, the maximum load is never above 1,500 tons, so you save a million dollars you thought you needed to spend on a fourth chiller, but you don't. You have plenty. The load isn't that big. And the whole thing was driven by data. They looked at where the energy was going, so they ended up in focusing in the utility plant, of course, on the chillers and the fans, and in the uses mainly on vacuum pumps and uh, process uh, cooling water in order to reduce the uh, indirect loads. And they designed based on measurements. So their vacuum pumps turned out to be 21% of their measured electrical load, and they figured out with the vendors and Semitech a protocol to signal when the pump isn't working, isn't, when it's idle, because tools use about as much energy idling as they do processing wafers, and nearly all of the idle energy can be saved. So their new vacuum pumps that signal when they're idle save as much process cooling water, or well, save a whole lot, about 30% higher efficiency they save 300 tons of cooling just on the vacuum pump idle signal. And then they also save nitrogen and altogether about 7% of total electricity. On exhaust, they recover some general exhaust heat, 
And then they worked with the tool makers to optimize for the right thermal constraints and ended up saving 50 cubic meters a second of both exhaust and makeup air. Think about the cost of conditioning that air. For process cooling water, they designed, as in the building HVAC I suggested, for small pressure drop, close approach heat exchangers, and that reduced their flow by 20%, 190 liters per second less. Their central utilities plant was 21% of their total load, so they split it into a low and a high temperature coil and optimized each chiller in each coil for its duty. A low temperature for condensing, high temperature for sensible. The, the high temperature chiller had a steadier load and it has heat recovery. So they ended up building one boiler and a backup for it, not six boilers, and the boilers hardly ever go on. And then they did humidification with a high-pressure spray, not with steam. So altogether, their NOx emissions in a NOx-critical area went down 60%. Very happy EPA. Then they did variable speed primary distribution, efficient pipes, pumps, variable speed motors, variable speed fans, and they were able to cover the redundancy requirements of both chillers with a single low-temperature spare chiller by a blending. They didn't need a spare for each one. On makeup air, they did runaround coils for free reheat. They did low phase velocity, although not as low as I would have expected for their smaller fans. I mentioned the high pressure humidification getting rid of the steam boilers. And they were investigating but had not yet executed enthalpy wheel recovery on the exhaust. That'll, that'll go in their next fab and a desiccant wheel uh, option that would eliminate the entire low temperature chiller plant. In other words, a passive latent heat exchanger from the exhaust to the intake air. That goes in the next plant. Recirc air was 10% of the fab load, and they discovered that they were way over designing. It was like belt and braces and going about holding up your trousers. So they took full credit for their mini environments and reduced their HEPA coverage from 50% to just 25 or 30 in the fan filter units, and that eliminated 300 tons of cooling right there. Now, because filter life goes as the inverse square of air velocity, they could pay for the extra FFUs in six years, which is a 13% ROI, by reduced filter replacement. And... Then they were testing different kinds of smocks because the, the workers could be cooler in warmer rooms and also because the wafers are already in the pods, they're less concerned about par particles. This has all worked out very well. They also did water efficiency. Uh, over 60% of their total water use was for uh, deionized. So they used the RO reject and some recycling to save 20% of the input. They did their evap and blowdown uh, with uh, wastewater, cutting over 50% by using the first stage brine. Their scrubbers replaced raw water purchase with fairly pure industrial waste that was quite adequate for the task. And altogether, they saved four megaliters a day of input. I think the state of the art on a US fab is 96% water recovery in Intel Albuquerque. They also used water, waterless urinals and um, an 8,000 cubic meter rainwater retention plan and native uh, plantings. And, you know, just, just this one measure was over two megaliters a year. In the admin building and often in the fab, they did passive solar orientation facing the right way, exterior shading. They used energy and daylighting models and found they could save 30,000 US dollars a year just by rotating the building 30 degrees before they built it. No extra cost. Um, they did light shelves, efficient dimming lights, super windows, high reflectance and infrared emissivity roof, and demand controlled ventilation. It's the same thing as you do in any good office. Now, compared with their previous best design, which they didn't know how to improve upon, I mentioned already the savings achieved but what shocked them was the 30% lower capex. It made it cheaper, cheaper than a Chinese fab. And then, of course, the next one was expected to save more and cost less, and it did. 
They recently designed it. Now, Better Optimized tool design was already driving half their savings, and they've been pushing that further. Um, in fact, ultimately, I think we can get over a decade or two to a factor eight or ten better fab by getting really serious about efficient tool design because the tool makers have not been told what it's worth to save a unit of electricity or exhaust or process cooling water. And now that they're starting to figure that out, they see it as a source of competitive advantage to do that design for their users. I think also we'll end up with a heat-driven desiccant to eliminate the low temp chiller, and we'll do on-site tri-generation or poly-generation of electricity, process heat, space heat, cooling. Thinking again about reducing load, suppose you're cooling a clean room. We often find, even nowadays, that the tool displays use cathode ray tubes that were left over from someplace. Well, it's very cheap to buy the, the flat panel display. In fact, it's probably cheaper now than the CRT. And it lasts longer. It doesn't drift. It's more reliable. It's easier to read, so you'll have fewer ergonomic errors. It doesn't weigh much. It has a small footprint, so there's less sizing in the uninterruptible power supply and the HVAC. It gives better laminar flow. It doesn't produce that severe thermal chimney that rises up and disrupts your laminar flow. It doesn't have a static charge attracting dust. It doesn't outgas, compromising the clean room. It's sealed. It doesn't have slots with airflow to gather and stir up dust. And it doesn't have the cathode ray tubes risks of implosion or high voltage or EMI. It seems pretty obvious we ought to get all our CRTs out of the clean room straight away. Here's a more interesting one. How about converting the fluorescent lamps in the clean room to a light pipe feed that filters out the heat before it gets into the cooled space? That reduces the heat by several fold. It doesn't disturb laminar flow or give static or EMI. And you don't have to have people walking into the clean room to replace lamps. And you don't have the risk of breaking lamps and strewing around phosphor and mercury. And you don't have particle shedding every time you turn the lamp on the contacts. There are no ballasts to fail or to outgas. It's easy to reconfigure the tint, like for photoresist or the location. And with indirect light bounced up off the ceiling, you can use five to seven times fewer lux for the same or better visibility. Better light, no flicker, no hum, less fatigue, better visibility, better productivity, fewer mistakes. You get the idea. Lots of multiple benefits from a single expenditure and easy to retrofit. Anything we can get out of the clean room is worth many, many dollars per watt to eliminate. Here's a typical lab consumption, uh, which didn't do very well on the lighting, but notice what it did to the ventilation and the cooling without any improvement to the lab equipment and saved five-eighths of the total energy at lower capex. And a lot of the key to that is the exhaust hoods, similar to those you'd find in Semicon. Um, there are two different approaches to efficient wet cam hoods that save about 70 or 80 percent of the energy and improve safety and cost less to build. They, they both do it by aerodynamics, <clears throat> and hoods often account for half to three quarters of the total energy used by a wet chem lab. You know, one hood is equivalent to many houses in energy use. Then we should use science-based standards for indoor air quality, sensor-based real-time controls. And when we realize what all this stuff costs, we'll start to encourage aqueous systems, non-toxic design, dry cleaning methods, supercritical CO2. And then we'll ask, if we don't want to breathe this stuff, why are we putting it up the stack so our neighbors can breathe it? Why don't we just design it out? To get the value you want out of a fab or another process plant, you have to specify the physical performance you want at a system and subsystem level. Reward the savings you get. Only reward them when they're measured clearly. Reward your designers for what they save, not what they spend. This is called performance-based design fees, and it's very effective. And especially <clears throat> back at the front end of your design process, reward your tool makers for system value. If you don't ask them to save watts and exhaust and cooling water and so on, and tell them what it's worth to you to save those, you won't get it. They'll just design what they first thought of. Is our next fab going to save half the energy? 
two-thirds like one we just did, 80%. How much less will it cost to build? 50% like one we just did? More? Well, let's go find out. And more broadly, if you look across the entire range of industry, I don't think there's any limit in sight for a very long time to how efficient we can get. Industry is a materials processing activity. I mentioned that 99.98% of our materials are wasted. Either they never get into durable products, or after they do, they don't recreate value. They're just thrown away. And as we dematerialize, that is, we make more artifacts with less stuff and better design, and we virtualize, and we make things last longer and close the materials loops and do integration between plants that can use each other's waste to create value, and then ultimately we'll get to desktop manufacturing. Most of that waste is going away. There is, of course, a lot of conventional innovation continuing with better technologies. There are important new kinds of processes like microfluidics, you know, in a t typical chemical works, most of your effort is, is not to do the basic reaction, but to separate the product you want from all the unwanted side products that came from side reactions occurring when the conditions of the reaction were not perfectly controlled. So in microfluidics, you have a stack of a bunch of typically silicon wafers with millimeter scale channels etched into them and little reaction chambers where you can very precisely control the mixing temperature, pressure, and time catalysis, so you get only the reaction you want. The side products aren't made in the first place, so you don't need to separate them. And you can often reduce the size and cost of that plant by orders of magnitude along with its energy use. Efficiency, of course, keeps getting bigger and cheaper through better technology, but the tunneling through the cost barrier through integrative design is the really <clears throat> big key we've got now. But next coming at us are two further design revolutions. One is innovation inspired by nature. Please read Janine Benyus's book, Biomimicry. It will just blow your minds about how nature has already solved your design problem. You just need to know which organisms to ask how they did it. And maybe nanotechnology in Eric Drexler's sense of self-assembling molecules at a molecular scale. Although I would add a word of caution about both of these. Nanomaterials are turning out as expected to be rather biologically risky, and biomimicry is not the same as biotechnology. It's really the opposite. You know, biotechnology will take a spider gene and put it into a goat where it doesn't belong so that the goat's milk will contain spider silk that you can then extract and make into things. Biomimicry will figure out how the spider makes the silk, the stuff that's tougher than Kevlar, stronger than steel, and it's made in ambient temperature and pressure under life-friendly conditions in the spider's belly out of digested crickets and flies, and then will imitate how the spider does that. That's biomimicry, very different. And over time, I think you'll find Darwin always beats Descartes. And then there are the options we haven't thought of yet. So if we get good at responsibly combining a large forebrain with opposable thumbs, you know, this zany evolutionary experiment we're engaged in, maybe we'll be around long enough to think of still more good ideas, but we certainly have plenty for now to be getting on with.